In the year 392, the young Western Roman Emperor Valentinian II sought to assert his authority by dismissing the Magister Militam, Arbogast, from his position. The situation escalated when, as reported by Zosimus, a public confrontation occurred between them at Vienne. Valentinian presented Arbogast with a letter of dismissal, but the general asserted that the emperor did not have the authority to grant or revoke his command. He then disdainfully discarded the letter and left. This was indeed the true political position, but it caused a crisis by being displayed in this naked fashion. Shortly thereafter, during a heated discussion between Arbogast and Valentinian, Philostorgius claimed that the emperor attempted to attack Arbogast, but was stopped by a palace guard. Valentinian found himself powerless, humiliated, and without support. On the 15th of May in 392, he was discovered hanged in his quarters. Arbogast insisted that it was a case of suicide. Arbogast relayed the news to Theodosius, the Eastern Emperor and Valentinian's brother-in-law, that the young emperor had taken his own life. This led to increased tension between the eastern and western halves of the empire during that summer. Despite Arbogast's attempts to communicate with Theodosius, it seemed that his messages did not reach beyond the eastern Praetorian prefect, Rufinus. The responses Arbogast received from Rufinus were uncooperative. Theodosius himself gradually became convinced that Valentinian had been murdered, partly due to his wife Galla's belief that her brother's death was the result of treachery. With the growing likelihood that Theodosius would take a hostile stance against Arbogast, the Frankish general decided to take the initiative. On 22 August, Arbogast made Eugenius the new ruler of the Western Empire. Eugenius was a well-respected scholar and a native Roman. His appointment was supported by the Praetorian prefect of Italy, Nicomachus Flavianus. However, some senators, including Symmachus, were uneasy about this. Additionally, there was uncertainty surrounding Valentinian's death, which had not been properly resolved. Furthermore, Eugenius had removed most of the senior civil officers left by Theodosius when he had given the western half of the empire to Valentinian causing Theodosius to lose control of the Western Roman Empire. When a group of Western ambassadors arrived in Constantinople to request recognition of Eugenius as the Western ruler, Theodosius did not give a clear response. It is unclear whether he had already decided to confront Eugenius and Arbogast at this point. Eventually, in January of 393, Theodosius declared his eight-year-old son, Honorius, as the new ruler of the Western Empire and resolved to invade the West. In the early months of 394, both factions geared up for war. Arbogast consolidated his forces from across Gaul and Italy, while Nicomachus installed new officials in Africa to safeguard Rome's grain supply. Fortunately, the supply remained secure. In Africa, Gildo, an appointee of Theodosius, was elevated to the esteemed position of Magister Eutriusc, akin to Arbogast's status. Remaining loyal to Constantinople, he had the potential to block Rome if ordered. But Theodosius opted for a land invasion through Illyricum, rendering any supply disruption to Rome futile. Theodosius assigned Timasius and Stilicho as the in-charge of the campaign. Over the subsequent 18 months, Theodosius prepared his forces for the impending invasion. The eastern armies had weakened following the passing of Emperor Valens and most of his soldiers at the Battle of Adrianople. Generals Flavius Stilicho and Timasius were tasked with reinstating discipline in the legions and replenishing their numbers through recruitment and conscription. Given Eugenius' public embrace of paganism, Theodosius encountered no difficulties in framing the conflict as a holy war. He employed fasting, prayer, and ceremonial supplications, the Christian equivalent of Flavius' festivals in Italy. Additionally, Theodosius sought the counsel of the eunuch Eutropius, who was dispatched from Constantinople to consult the revered hermit John of Lycopolis in the Egyptian town of Lycopolis. John prophesied a bittersweet outcome, Theodosius would emerge victorious after significant bloodshed, but he would meet his end in Italy. In May 394, the Eastern Army departed from Constantinople, marching westward. 
The revitalized legions were reinforced by numerous barbarian auxiliaries, including over 20,000 Visigoth federates and additional units from Syria. Theodosius himself led the army. Among his commanders were his own generals Stilicho and Timasius, the Visigoth chieftain Alaric, and a Caucasian Iberian named Bakirios Hiberios. Notably, there was also a substantial Alanic and Hunnic presence. Arbogast, along with the puppet emperor Eugenius, gathered his troops in Milan. He was joined by Flavianus, who had sought favorable omens through sacred rituals. Arbogast's army consisted mainly of fellow Franks, Alemanni, and Gallo-Romans, along with his Gothic auxiliaries. According to Christian accounts, this force of the West was portrayed as the last Roman army to march under the symbols of Jupiter with golden thunderbolts and his invincible son Hercules. The Eastern Roman armies advanced through Pannonia to the Julian Alps was unopposed. Theodosius and his officers grew suspicious when they found the eastern ends of the mountain passes undefended. Arbogast, drawing from his experience fighting against the usurper Magnus Maximus in Gaul, believed that the best strategy was to keep his forces united to defend Italy itself. As a result, he left the Alpine passes unguarded. Thanks to Arbogast's cohesive strategy, the Theodosian army passed through the Alps unimpeded and descended towards the valley of the Frigidus River to the east of the Roman port of Aquileia. It was there, in the narrow, mountainous region, that they encountered the western army's encampment within the Claustra Alpium Eulirum in the early days of September. Emperor Theodosius, observing from his camp, could see Arbogast's army with their rear to the river Frigidus, positioned in a strongly entrenched manner with the standard of Jove overseeing their camp. Their lines extended to face across the mouth of the pass, and they had already secured the critical high points, leaving Theodosius with no opportunity for flanking maneuvers. The sun hung low in the sky casting an eerie glow over the battlefield as the Eastern Roman army, led by Emperor Theodosius, prepared to launch their frontal assault. The air was thick with tension and the smell of sweat, fear, and determination. The Visigothic troops, fierce and proud, formed the vanguard of the assault. Their eyes were set on the lines of Arbogast's Western Roman forces, who stood ready, defiant and unwavering. As Theodosius raised his arm, signaling the advance, a roar erupted from the eastern ranks. The Visigoths surged forward, their war cries mingling with the clatter of armor and the thunder of hooves. The ground trembled beneath their feet as they charged, a wave of humanity crashing towards the western lines. The clash was immediate and brutal. Steel met steel with a deafening clang as the Visigoths collided with Arbogast's forces. The front lines became a blur of chaos, men grappling and striking, shouting and screaming. Blood splattered the ground, staining the earth beneath them. The eastern army's headlong attack, while fierce, was met with an equally ferocious defense. Arbogast's men were disciplined and well prepared. They held their ground, their shields forming an unbreakable wall, their spears thrusting forward with deadly precision. Theodosius's troops, despite their valor, struggled to break through. As the hours passed, the sun began to sink lower, casting long shadows across the battlefield. The cries of the wounded and dying filled the air, a haunting symphony of agony. Among the fallen was Bacurius, a general of renown, his lifeless body a stark reminder of the battle's toll.
The sight of their fallen leader momentarily faltered the eastern troops, their resolve shaken. Visigoths could see their comrades falling around them. The once formidable Visigothic vanguard now a patchwork of the dead and dying. They realized that they were being used as fodder, their lives deemed less valuable than those of the Roman soldiers behind them. The bitterness began to fester, a seed of resentment that would grow with each passing moment of the carnage. As nightfall approached, Theodosius called for a retreat. The order spread through the ranks, a wave of reluctant withdrawal. The Visigoths and the rest of the Eastern army pulled back, their bodies battered, their spirits bruised. The field was left littered with the slain, a testament to the day's brutal combat. Among the dead lay 10,000 Gothic auxiliaries, their sacrifice a stark and bitter reminder of the cost of war. Theodosius, in his tent, pondered the day's events. The assault had been costly, the gains negligible. He knew that tomorrow would bring another clash, another test of will and strength. As he looked out at the stars, he couldn't shake the feeling that the old gods were indeed favoring Arbogast, their ancient powers lending strength to his foe. The first day of battle had ended, but the war was far from over. The fields of Frigidus would see more bloodshed before the end, and the fate of the empire hung in the balance. Eugenius was confident that the battle was nearly won, and his optimism spread among his troops. Arbogast deployed a significant force to execute a covert maneuver across the passes to attack Theodosius from the rear. Meanwhile, in Theodosius' camp, despair loomed, and the emperor spent much of the night in fervent prayer, feeling abandoned by God. According to Theodoret, he received encouragement from two heavenly figures, Saint John and Saint Philip, who appeared to him dressed in white. Additionally, the troops sent to flank the eastern army signaled their willingness to betray Arbogast for a substantial sum, which was promptly agreed upon. The following day, the attack resumed. Dawn broke over the battlefield of Frigidus with a crimson sky, an ominous prelude to the day's renewed hostilities. The bodies from the previous day's clash lay as grim markers, a silent testament to the fierce struggle between Theodosius's eastern Roman army and Arbogast's western forces. The eastern troops, though bruised and weary, steeled themselves for another day of battle, driven by duty and the desire to avenge their fallen comrades. Emperor Theodosius surveyed the field with a heavy heart. The bitter fighting had been indecisive, and he knew the cost of another headlong assault would be high. Yet, there was no choice. Arbogast's lines still stood firm, and the fate of the empire rested on breaking them. The Visigoths, despite their losses, stood ready once more, their eyes burning with a mixture of anger and determination. They had bled for Theodosius, and today, they would either triumph or die trying. As the morning sun climbed higher, the two armies clashed again. The roar of battle once again filled the air, a cacophony of shouts, the clash of steel, and the thud of arrows finding their marks. The fighting was fierce, and the lines surged back and forth, neither side gaining a decisive advantage. Theodosius's forces pushed with all their might, but Arbogast's men held their ground, their shields interlocked in a seemingly impenetrable wall. Then, as the sun reached its zenith, something extraordinary happened, a chill swept over the battlefield, and the air pressure began to drop. Those who had fought in the region before recognized the signs and exchanged wary glances. The Bora was coming. At first, it was just a whisper, a gentle breeze that caused the banners to flutter. But within moments, it grew into a howling gale.
The Bora, with its cyclonic winds of over 60 mile per hour, roared down from the mountains, its icy breath cutting through the rains. The wind blew directly into the faces of Arbogast's men, a relentless force of nature that no shield could deflect. The effect was immediate and devastating. Dust and debris were whipped into the air, blinding the western troops. The powerful gusts pressed against their shields, forcing them back and disrupting their formation. Missiles launched by Arbogast's archers were caught in the wind, deflected back upon their own lines, adding to the chaos. The soldiers struggled to hold their ground, but the wind was unrelenting, an invisible enemy that battered them from all sides. For the eastern forces, it was as if the gods themselves had intervened. The wind was at their backs, pushing them forward with renewed vigor. With the western lines in disarray, Theodosius's troops pressed their advantage. They charged with renewed ferocity, their swords cutting through the disrupted ranks of Arbogast's men. The wind drove them on, pushing them closer, until they were upon the enemy, their momentum unstoppable. Arbogast's formation, once so disciplined and strong, crumbled under the combined assault of the eastern forces and the Bora's fury. Soldiers stumbled and fell, their lines breaking apart as panic set in. Theodosius's men poured through the gaps, their war cries echoing above the howling wind. As the afternoon wore on, the western forces broke completely. The wind had done its work, sowing confusion and fear among Arbogast's men. They fled the battlefield, their retreat turning into a rout. Theodosius's army pursued, cutting down the stragglers, their victory assured by the relentless Bora. The heavily fortified camp of Western Romans was overrun, and Eugenius was personally captured. As the shattered army either fled or surrendered hastily, Arbogast managed to escape to the mountain. Despite Eugenius's pleas for mercy, he was swiftly put to death, and his head was displayed on a spear. After wandering in the mountains for several days, Arbogast came to realize the futility of his situation and chose to end his life in the noble Roman manner. Upon receiving the news, Nicomachus Flavianus, confronted with the utter collapse of his cause and faith, followed suit. Theodosius once again entered Italy without facing any opposition. Surprisingly, he displayed significant clemency towards those who had openly opposed him. Nicomachus Flavianus the Younger, the former prefect of the city, was spared severe punishment after his father-in-law, Symmachus, interceded on his behalf. Others were forgiven, but it is believed that they were required to convert to Christianity. The victory had come at a high cost for Theodosius and had resulted in a complete defeat for Eugenius. A contemporary Roman historian noted that since the Goths suffered the majority of the casualties, Theodosius won two battles at Frigidus, one against Eugenius and the other against the Goths. Just four months later, he passed away, leaving the government in the hands of his young children, Honorius and Arcadius. 
However, the battle also hastened the decline of the Roman army in the west. The losses at the Battle of the Frigidus weakened the Western legions, leading to an increased reliance on barbarian mercenaries known as Federati, who often proved to be untrustworthy or even treacherous.